Welcome to another edition of Anthony T's Horror and Wrestling Show. I'm Anthony T. This is the last new show of 2022. As next episode will be a best of show, which I'll talk more about at the end of this podcast. I have a fully loaded show. I have no guest on, but I have an extra segment this time around. It's fully loaded because, well, there's three major topics I need to talk about. First topic. Next segment will be the ongoing New England Horrorcon situation. Because, yes, yours truly has thoughts on this because this is getting to the point where I just hate the New England horror con scene right now, quite frankly. I talked about this with Andrew on a recent episode of Two From Hell. I believe it was the October episode where Terracon and CT Horror Fest were running back-to-back weekends. Well, Silver Scream Con announced their dates, and guess what? They're running the week before Terracon. I'll tell you more about it next segment, but I really hate it right now. Because, quite frankly, I'll tell you this right now. You have three horror cons in three weekends in one area. That is just ridiculous. I'll talk more about that next segment. Then after that, I will talk about AEW's Full Gear. I'll go over what I liked, what I didn't like. Then I will go over WWE Survivor Series. Same thing. What I like, what I didn't like. Then in What's Anthony T. Watching, I review a film that I received a request for to be reviewed. As a filmmaker wanted me to review his film, which I have no problem with. Feel free to send me your films. I'll review it on the podcast. At the end of the podcast. Feel free. I'll talk more about that in what's Anthony T. Watching. So we have five segments this episode. Instead of the normal four. So you, we've got my thoughts on the horror con scene. AEW Full Gear, that's one segment. WWE Survivor Series, that's one segment. And what's Anthony T. Watching and an outro to wrap out 2022 on the podcast. But first, the news. Starting off the news, what wouldn't be the last episode of 2022 if I did not have to talk about my favorite topic on the podcast? Wait for it. Wait for it. Jason Blum in Blumhouse Productions. As this time, they are in talks with James Wan and his production company, Atomic Monster, to merge. That's right. There's talks of a big horror merger between two of the most prolific people in horror. James Wan, and Jason Blum. Now, this is my thoughts on the merger. Please, I really do not want to see this merger happen, quite frankly. Don't get me wrong. I like Jason Blum. I like James Wan. But these two do not need to merge. It is not good for the horror genre if both powerhouses merged into one company. It would be nice to have Two competing companies. That means we get more great horror films, quite possibly. It's like, why are they doing this? Seriously. James Wan can make a killing, too. There's a lot of open space in the horror market, and this has been a banner year for horror. Look at films like Smile. Look at films like... Halloween Ends that did decently. Look at even Terrifier 2, who made $11 million without any publicity. It's been a banner year for the horror genre. Look at the Black Phone as well. But we really do not need to talk about mergers here. 
with quite possibly the two biggest names in horror today. But that's what we are doing here. And it's not good if those two are going to merge into one company. It's still going to be called Blumhouse, that's for sure. But I don't understand James Wan wanting to merge his Atomic Monster company into Blumhouse. Because right now, I really believe we're on a cusp of a big horror boom here. And this year really proved it. I don't know why James Wan all of a sudden decided that maybe it's time to talk to Jason Blum about selling his production company. I don't get it. We are near a horror boom if we're not there already. We had a lot of big horror films this year. We're going to be in a nice period of horror for the next couple of years. I don't get why... James Wan wants to sell Atomic Monster to Jason Blum. Because quite frankly, we are at the cusp, if not already, at a big horror boom, people. You would think these producers, these people in Hollywood, would know when the going is good. And right now, horror films are really good at the box office. As this year was probably one of its best years in quite a while. I just don't get it why James Wan wants to sell his production company and merge with Blumhouse. Because quite frankly, there's no need to merge with Blumhouse people. Especially with the caliber of town of James Wan. He does not need to merge with Jason Blum. They don't need to merge. It's okay for them to run separate companies. We get more great horror from both James Wan and Jason Blum. It's mind-boggling why James Wan wants to merge his company with Jason Blum. Because quite frankly, now is not the time to cash out and merge. Considering the success of the Conjuring Universe and the Insidious franchise. I just don't get James Wan. I really don't. But we'll see if this merger happens or not. I'm hoping not. Because I like competition. And when you have two of the best names in horror merging into one company, that's not good for the horror genre. Especially at a time when the horror genre is thriving. Moving on. Mia Goth gets nominated for an Independent Spirit Award for her performance in Pearl. Now, this is a film I recently watched, actually. I actually watched Pearl for the first time between episodes, as that film recently got released on Blu-ray. And let me tell you, it is a great film. It is such a great film. When I found out when Mia Goth was nominated for an Independent Spirit Award, for best lead female performance for a Pearl, I was very happy because this is a performance that is a great performance. It is probably the best female performance this year. I've seen a lot of horror films, quite frankly. This is on a whole nother level, her performance in Pearl. It's a film that you really need to go check out. As this is just a great film, period. But it has a great leading performance by Mia Goth. I really liked her performance in this film. As she really does a great job playing the title character here. I like how she delivers the monologues in the film as well. As they really keep you glued to the screen. It's something that, if you're a fan of acting in general, you have to check this film out. I know it's not your type of film, all you serious film lovers, but Pearl is definitely falls into this serious film type, as this has a completely different vibe from X, which was released earlier this year. And a lot of the credit why Pearl is so successful is Mia Goth and her performance in this film. She just makes the character her own. Forget her portrayal as Maxine in X. This is way better than 
Maxine and X. She does a great job carrying this movie from start to finish. And I'm very happy that this performance is getting some sort of mainstream recognition. Because normal horror films don't get n mainstream notice, people. This is big for a female performance like Mia Goths in Pearl to be nominated for an Independent Spirit Award with the likes of Kate Blanchett, Regina Hall, and Michelle Yeoh is an accomplishment unto itself. Because Mia Goth's performance in Pearl really is what drives this film. And it is great to see that horror is getting recognized on a mainstream level. Especially at the Independent Spirit Awards, which is pretty much the equivalent to the Oscars for independent films. So it was nice to see Mia Goth getting a nomination for Best Actress. I wish Ty West got a Best Director nomination, too. Because the direction in that film was great. It's literally probably the best film I've seen all year. It literally knocked X off my list... As the best film of the year. Hands down. I don't think this going to be another film that tops Pearl. Especially this late in the year. It is such a great film people. Check out Pearl. Whenever you can. And definitely check it out for Mia Goth's performance. And it's great to see that she's finally getting recognized. As she's a very good actress. And with that, that's the news. Welcome to Dark Discussions, your place for the discussion of horror film, fiction, and all that's fantastic. A weekly podcast here, the discussion is about the most recent horror and genre films. Intelligent talk on a genre that deserves intelligence. A conversation between co-hosts discussing not only the film, but also the connotation that the directors and screenwriters are trying to articulate. If you want more than a review, listen to Dark Discussions. And speaking of perception, there's just one more scene I want to talk about, which is after Caleb discovers that Kyoto is a robot, Kyoto kind of peels off her skin, showing him what's underneath. Now, wait a minute. I know where you're going with this, but tell me you weren't already thinking this 15 minutes earlier in the film. Exactly what he's thinking at that moment. Which is he's a robot, too. Oh, I considered the possibility. Right, and that's what I like, is the fact that the writers were smart enough to know that this is what the audience would be thinking. We've all seen Blade Runner. <laughs> right. <laughs> Exactly. www.darkdiscussions.com Wherever podcasts are found. The following commentary represents the views of Anthony T's horror and wrestling show and not of the Dark Discussions Network, meaning it's the views of mine and mine only. Welcome back. Now, this is the part of the show where I should be talking about how great this year was for horror. Because we have some great horror on both the studio level and the independent level. But I cannot talk about that, apparently. Because the January episodes are best of lists in award show episodes. So... I'm not going to have time to talk about this in January. So, it's either now or never. And I am going to talk about this now. Because I am sick of the New England horror con scene. It is so stupid. Now, you may have heard me talk about it endlessly on this podcast. How we need more horror cons in the New England area. And it's great that we have four horror cons in the area. But here's the bleeping problem, everyone. There's three shows running back to back to back weekends. This is bleeping childish, everyone. I really do not get these promoters. Seriously. It's like they're trying to one-up each other. This is not good here, people. 
I'll start this whole thing off here. This all started when Terracon recently announced that they were coming back, taking over the second weekend of September, usually is the time for when CT Horror Fest runs its show. As Terracon is running in Marlboro, Mass, September 15th through the 17th, usually that weekend is reserved for CT Horror Fest. Then CT Horror Fest announced their dates in Hartford, Connecticut at the XL Center for September 23rd and 24th. One weekend after TerraCon. And now most recently, Silver Scream Con recently announced their dates, which they will be running in Danvers, Mass, September 8th through the 10th. Are you kidding me here? Seriously. Three horror cons in three weeks in the New England area. This area cannot support three horror cons in three weeks. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. I don't get this. Seriously. It's like, who can top each other here? It's ridiculous. Everyone's acting childish here. It's like, oh, I'm going to steal their date. So, you know what? I'll go the weekend after. You know what? Oh, there's a con on the 15th through the 17th. I'll run my show September 8th through the 10th. This is ridiculous. As a con-goer myself, it is impossible to attend all three shows. When you factor in other shows in October and November. It's ridiculous. Seriously. Let alone one con, but three cons in three weeks? It's ridiculous. I don't understand here why everybody's trying to one-up each other here in New England. We should be a healthy New England horror community here. Not a horror community where the promoters are trampling over each other. Because that's what the promoters of these cons are doing. They're trying to be childish. They're trying to one-up each other. Trying to put the other out of business. I don't see this in New Jersey. Case in point. Monster Mania is set to run their next convention March 10th through the 13th in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Now, New Jersey has another horror con that runs around the same time. The New Jersey Horror Con and Film Festival. That's running March 24th through March 26th. That's about a good couple weeks. This breather room. But here we have three conventions running Three consecutive weekends. And I'm going to tell you something here. This is not good for the fans because now they have to choose which convention they want to go to. Because you all know, not many of them can go to all three of them. It's going to be dependent on guest lineup. Second, this really hurts the vendors. Trust me, I made some friends over the years in the con scene who are vendors... This does not help vendors. Seriously, if you have one show one week, one show the next, and another show the week after, it's like a lottery for these vendors to guess which show is going to be the better one. Or the if this show's going to be drawing the fans in. And that's going to hurt their bottom line. And it's not fair. Seriously, there needs to be some breather. There's like... No horror conventions in New England between January and August. It's like, that would be a perfect time to run a horror convention. Seriously, it would be a perfect time to get people to go. Maybe especially between the months of March and May. But everybody wants to cram their horror convention in three straight weekends. This area, I don't think, can hold... Three horror conventions in three weekends. Successful ones at that. It's going to come down to guest lineup. I'm telling that right now. Because whoever has the best guest lineups are going to succeed. Because I don't see all three of them succeeding. Not especially when it's back to back to back weekends in virtually the same 50 mile area. Three horror conventions. 
I don't get this. I've never seen this before. Seriously. Three conventions in three weeks. I don't see three Comic-Con conventions, big ones, in three straight weeks. Why do we need to have three Horror-Con conventions in three straight weeks, people? This is childish. It seems like promoters are trying to knock other promoters out of the way, and that's not good for the horror scene in the New England area, people. Seriously. It is not good at all. Because it's probably going to put one of these three cons out of business. I can guarantee you that. Because there's no way I see all three of them surviving. Unless one of them moves their date. Because quite frankly, this is really bad, people. It's like choosing which one you really want to go to. You want to go meet your friends. That's the point of a horror con. Have fun. Meet your friends. Get autographs from celebs. Spend money at the vendors. But having three horror cons in three weeks is not going to help vendors. It's going to hurt some vendors. That's for sure. Because if you're a vendor, you're scared about wanting to vend at one of these horror cons. Either at Silver Scream Con, Terror Con, or CT Horror Fest. Because you don't know if they're going to draw in the people. Because... There could be fatigue. And the real loser of this three-week batch is CT Horror Fest. Because, quite frankly, they need to put out a big show. And the fact that they are going on last is not a good sign for this show. Somebody needs to move out of September. That's the only way these three shows can thrive. We want these shows to thrive. Not have the shows... Fight over the same month. Because having three horror cons in one area in one month in three weekends straight is ridiculous and childish. Because I don't understand why everybody has to have this show in September. you got every, October. I don't understand why n nobody runs in October. The only show that runs in October is Monster Expo, which is a very good show. I don't understand why everybody feels the need to run it in September next year. Really. I don't get it, quite frankly. It's taking away from horror fans. Because you're forcing them to choose which shows to go to. You may have a situation where you have horror fans. Maybe not going to all three. Maybe not going to two of them. Maybe just going to one of them. And that's not good for the horror con scene here in New England. The fact that Silver Screen Con, Terror Con, and CT Horror Fest have booked their shows three consecutive weekends in September is not good for the horror scene in New England. We want all these cons to thrive. We want these vendors to thrive. But if you're fighting over dates... And fighting over childish stuff. Because this is why I think it's going on here. Because why would... Why is this? Seriously. Why can't we have three shows separated? Quite frankly. It's very sad. That the horror con scene in New England has come to... We're all going to fight for the territory. And it's not supposed to be that way, people. You can have two or three horror cons thrive... You can have four even thrive. But this is ridiculous. And this is why I truly hate the New England horror con scene now. Because it's just become a battle of survival. A battle of who takes over the territory. And it's not supposed to be this way, people. It should be about the fans. Not the promoters. And having three horror cons in three weekends is not... About the fans, people. I'm sorry. As you're just making people pick and choose. And it's not supposed to be that way. It's The con should be about the fans. Who support these celebs and vendors. Because they're the real losers. Of this three consecutive weekend fiasco in September. Regarding Silver Scream Con, Terror Con, and CT Horror Fest. As cons should be about the fans and not 
and the vendors, not the promoters, who only care about greed. As this is what it is, greed, greed, greed. As somebody wants September and the whole New England horror scene to themselves. And it's quite sad, frankly. I'm sorry, but that's the way I see it right now. And that's why I hate the New England horror con scene right this moment. Hey guys, this is Steven Christina. I'm the founder, owner, creator, and host of Super Retro Throwback Reviews. Are you looking for the best movie reviews, music reviews, video game reviews, and Comic Con coverage all around? Well then look no further. Definitely check out Super Retro Throwback Reviews on YouTube and our new audio podcast, the new and improved Super Retro Throwback Reviews Audio Files version 2.0 on the following media distributors. Podbean, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, and Spotify. Class is over, John. Time for something new and improved. Every day, there's a family struggling with hospital bills to care for their sick child who is fighting an illness. There's a woman who is fighting breast cancer and is having trouble making ends meet while paying for their treatment. And there are burn victims that are going through treatments to heal their deep wounds. There is a charity in the horror community that helps these people. Scares That Care is an organization that helps families deal with the bills for their child. They help women get the treatment they need to fight breast cancer. And they help people who are dealing with severe burns get the help they need to heal. Scares That Care is a 100% volunteer organization and 501c3 nonprofit charity that is dedicated to helping these people in fighting real monsters. To find out more information or to donate to Scares That Care, you can go to www.scaresthatcare.org. Every donation helps Scares That Care fight real monsters. Welcome back. Now, this episode, I will be reviewing not one, but two Major wrestling shows, ladies and gentlemen. That's right, there were two major wrestling pay-per-views that took place in the month of November. You have AEW's Full Gear, and you'll have my thoughts on WWE Survivor Series. First off, I'm going to start off with AEW's Full Gear, since that event took place on November 19th. That was the card that had MJF versus John Moxley as the main event. You also had the Acclaim versus Swerve in our glory for the tag titles. Jungle Boy versus Luchasaurus and more. It started off with AEW Zero Hour as the first match. Orange Cassidy, the best friends, Rocky Romero and Dan Housen defeated the Factory of QT Marshall, Nick Camarado, Aaron Solo, Lee Johnson and Cole Cotter. It was an okay match to start. Like the ending though, when Dean Housen finally came out, it wasn't that much of a match. Then, absolute rookie stocks defeated the machine Brian Cage in a world title eliminator tournament semifinal match. Then the main event of AEW Zero was Eddie Kingston versus June. Akiyama in a very good match. Overall, I think that was one of the best matches on the night as Eddie Kingston defeated Akiyama. Definitely go out of your way to check out the last match on Zero Hour on YouTube because that was just pure strong style wrestling. If you're a fan of Japanese wrestling, that is a really good match to check out. Then we get to the main card. It started off with the Steel Cage match. Jungle Boy Jack Perry defeated Luchasaurus in a very good match. I thought that match really was good. It had a couple cool spots in it. You had Jungle Boy Jack Perry take a dive off the top of the cage through a table. Then nailing his finisher submission for the win. That was a very good opening match. Then you had the Elite versus the Death Triangle. In which the Death Triangle won when Ray Phoenix clocked Kenny Omega with a hammer. And a, this was a very good match. And afterwards it set up a best of seven series. I like what they are doing with this feud. 
Elite. It's not like they're handing the titles back to the Elite, which I was hoping they wouldn't do. I would have had no problem if they earned it down the line. But if you're going to have a best of seven series, then that's the way you do it. If you're going to give the titles back to the Elite. I have no problem with that. Them having to earn it by winning four matches. So, overall, it was a really good booking decision. I know I don't like cheap finishes like that with the hammer being used as a weapon. But it set up something. You're going to get probably six more matches between the two teams. Because there's no doubt in my mind that we're going to have seven matches. Let's face it, everyone. You're going to have seven matches here in this feud. That's my prediction with this feud. You'll have seven matches. And you'll probably have the Elite go over. And that would be fine with me because they have earned it. It's not like they were, came back and just handed the titles. Which I was very worried about. But at least they're going to have to earn it. And right now, it looks like it's going to go seven matches. It's, they've already had three matches in that series. And it's two to one death triangle. So, I really think it's still going to go seven matches. Then you had the TBS Championship match. Jade Cogkill defeated the native beast Nyla Rose. Keeping Jade Cogkill's undefeated streak. Then, another match that was really good on this card... The Ring of Honor World Championship match. Chris Jericho defended the Ring of Honor World Championship by defeating the American Dragon Brian Danielson, the Spanish God Sammy Guevara, and Claudio Castanoli. One of the things I really liked about this match was you had Jericho fighting Guevara. You had Claudio fighting Brian. I liked the fact that all these four guys were fighting for this title. Nobody was trying to lay down like the infamous finger point of doom or some shenanigan like that. You had four wrestlers going for a title. This was a tricky match because you had two wrestlers from each stable in this match. You had two wrestlers from the Jericho Appreciation Society and you had two wrestlers from... The Blackpool Combat Club in this match. I like the fact that all four wrestlers wrestled each other. Including their own stable mates. And not like just help one to win the title. It made it a very great match. And I like the fact that you had an interaction between Guevara and Jericho. And there was no shenanigans where Guevara was trying to help Jericho win this match. As Guevara was trying to win this match for himself. This was easily Chris Jericho's best title defense with the Ring of Honor World Championship. As I was not happy when he won the title. But the matches he's been having with the title have been very good. And this is probably his best match yet. Can't wait to see what they do with him at Ring of Honor Final Battle. Then we had Dr. Britt Baker DMD versus Soraya. This is a very interesting match because this is the first time Soraya has wrestled in about five years. Overall, it was an okay match. As I could understand Soraya having ring rust and everything. It was good with Soraya picking up the win. I hope she continues to approve because... Before she got injured, she was one of the best women's wrestlers out there. Then you had the TNT Championship match. Wardlow defending the title against Samoa Joe and Powerhouse Hobbs. This was an okay match. Do I think the right person won? Yes. I have no problem with the result of this match. I can understand why they took the title off Wardlow. I know you wanted him to go on this huge, long winning streak. And don't get me wrong, I wanted it too. But since you have a Ring of Honor pay-per-view coming up next, to have Samoa Joe walk into the Ring of Honor pay-per-view, not only as the Ring of Honor World 
TV champion, but the TNT champion is trying to drum up interest for that pay-per-view. And I can understand what they did with this booking decision. And they also had Powerhouse Hobbs take the submission here so they can continue the Samoa Joe Wardlow feud. I could see Wardlow getting the title back eventually, but I have no problems with the decision making of giving Samoa Joe the title because I got a feeling Wardlow may be on the next Ring of Honor pay-per-view. Then we had Sting in Darby Allen versus Jay Lethal in Jeff Jarrett. It was an okay match. What am I going to say? Sting and Darby Allen won. Then we had the AEW Interim Women's Title Match. Tori Storm versus Jamie Hayter. And probably what I thought was probably the biggest surprise of the night. Jamie Hayter defeating Tori Storm to become the Interim Women's World Champion. Then after the match, a couple days later, Thunder Rosa vacated the title and Jamie... Hater became the outright AEW Women's Champion. Also, by Thunder Rosa vacating the title, Tori Storm's reign as interim champion counted as a regular title reign as well for her. Speaking of the match, there was a lot of interference from Rebel and Dr. Britt Baker DMD. But still, I think, again, like the Samoa Joe title change. I have no problem with it as Jamie Hayter is getting over in that division. Hayter has come a long way from being cut from AEW as she was in AEW at the beginning of AEW until the pandemic hit then was cut then got re-signed and she's I think one of the three best women's wrestlers on that roster alongside Britt Baker and Tori Storm. As her and Tori Storm had a very good match. Then we had the tag team match. The Acclaimed versus Swerve in our glory. The Acclaimed retained the AEW tag team titles by defeating Swerve in our glory. During the match, Keith Lee walked away from Swerve Strickland after Swerve Strickland tried to get Keith Lee to cheat. By handing him pliers. Lee refused and walked away. Leaving Swerve on his own. The Acclaim took the advantage. And retained the AEW tag team titles. And in the main event. MJF became the new AEW World Heavyweight Champion. By defeating John Moxley. In a match where it was good. But it's kind of predictable. I had this feeling... MJF was winning this title and signs were pointing that William Regal was going to turn on Moxley in a line with MJF. And that did happen in this match. But sometimes predictability is a good thing. And it gives MJF the world title. That's the right call. He should have a long world title reign. Probably all the way until maybe all out or full gear next year. He needs to have this title for more than six months. A, to bring Prestige back into that world title. And B, to help get ratings up. As ratings have been down for AEW. Overall, this was a very good show. I liked the show a lot. This had some very good matches. Including the cage match. The Ring of Honor World title match. The, the Trios title match. And the uh, women's interim title match. Overall, this was a very good show from AEW. Probably a 4 out of 5. Really cannot wait to see what happens next in AEW. So I hope they move on. As this year has been kind of a turmoil year for them. But they haven't stopped putting out good product. And it really shows with all four of their pay-per-views this year. Let me... Take a quick break, and we'll get to WWE Survivor Series as we continue on this very packed show to end 2022, as this is the last new show of the year, as next episode will be a best of. They're coming to get you, Barbara. This is Carrie. This is Billy. 
This is Mr. Poe. And we are from a podcast from beneath. You can catch us every Wednesday wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Hi, I'm Anthony T. And I'm director Andrew Duran. And we are the Two Two from from Hell. And we're putting Rated R back into podcasting. Every month we will be dropping an episode on the Doc Discussions Network. We'll be chatting about some of our favorite films news, reviews, and maybe interviews. You can find Two From Hell on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcast providers. And don't forget to like us on Facebook and Instagram at Two From Hell Podcast. Trust me, you're seriously not going to want to miss the show. Welcome back. Now, yours truly has an extra segment this episode. That's right, as I'm talking about WWE Survivor Series that took place on November 26th in Boston, Massachusetts. This pay-per-view only had like five matches, or I always fumble this up, premium live event. Because I always say pay-per-views because, well... I'm normally buying a pay-per-view for these shows. I still never can get this premium live event thing whenever watching a WWE event. Because, well, I'm just used to saying pay-per-view. And we always have the same discussion every time I talk about a WWE event on the podcast. Let's get on to the event. Before I go into this review, I have to say, I don't like this whole thing about pinfalls and submissions in a War Games match. I'm more about the old school type, where it was submit or surrender. I like that concept better. It made it different from other matches. This just feels like a normal match. We throw two teams together of five. You either get a pinfall or a submission in the match. That's it. I just don't like the concept. Seriously. You should go back to the old days where it's submit or surrender. It made the match very interesting. And it also made sure you had some sort of submission type finish. Because that's what made War Game special. Not this pinfall crap, because you see all this pinfalls in these War Games matches nowadays. But I digress. Let's just get to the event. As this first match was the Raw Women's War Game match, which featured Team Bianca Belair of Bianca Belair, Becky Lynch, Mia Yim, Alexa Bliss, and Asuka versus Team Damage Control of Bailey, Dakota Kai, Elo Sky, Nikki Cross, and Rhea Ripley. This was a very good match to start off this pay-per-view or premium live event. As I really enjoyed the hell out of this match. This was crazy. As this match had everything. Garbage lids, trash cans, ladders, kendo sticks. It also had some really good spots in the match, including Nikki Cross hitting a cross body from the top of the cage. Elo Sky hitting a moonsault from the top of the cage. You also had a nice spot where Nikki Cross gets handcuffed to Alexa Bliss. Rhea Ripley sending Mia Yim through a ladder. This had some really... Good ring work, as all the women worked very well in this match. The finish came when Bianca Belair hit the KOD on Bailey, and Becky Lynch hit a leg drop from the top of the cage to send Dakota Kai and Elo Sky through the table for the victory in a very good opening match to this pay-per-view. As this was a really good show, I had a fun time watching this match. Moving on, the second match was Finn Balor versus AJ Styles. I thought this was a very good match. Both of them worked very well in the ring together. They worked a more slow pace to start off the match, which was good. 
that I picked up during the course of the match, which I liked. There was also shenanigans in the middle of the match when AJ Styles went for a flying forearm at one point in Dominic Mysterio grabs his leg, which led to a fight outside between Damian Priest, Dominic Mysterio, and the Good Brothers. All four of them ended up brawling all the way to the back. Then it was one-on-one. -on -one. That's when the action really picked up in this match, when it became one-on-one, -on -one, as there was some nice back-and-forth action, a lot of intense action, as at one point, AJ Styles had Finn Balor in the calf crusher, only to have his face slammed to the mat by Finn Balor. Finish came when AJ Styles was outside the ring and nailing Finn Balor with an elbow strike. Now, you got to remember, there's two rings in this setup because of the war game setup. And he was, like, in the middle of the two rings when this happened. AJ Styles hits his finish with a flying forearm for the victory. Then we got probably the worst match of the night. Ronda Rousey versus Shotzi. It was nice to see that it wasn't half Raw, half SmackDown. I liked how they mixed everything up. But this match was there. I did not enjoy this match at all. Ronda Rousey looked awful in this match. Why is she still the women's champion? I really don't get WWE's decision to get the belt off Liv Morgan to give it back to Ronda Rousey. As Ronda Rousey doesn't seem to care about this company. As she really put half the effort in this match. There are more women on that roster that put in more effort than Ronda Rousey does. But don't get the spotlight. I just don't get it. It's just, I don't, there was no intensity. It felt like for most of the match, Ronda Rousey was throwing judo throws. It was boring. Shotzi tried their best to make this entertaining, but it, to me, it looked like Ronda Rousey was disinterested in this match. If you're performing and you look disinterested, why are you performing in wrestling? Seriously. That's what's been with Ronda Rousey. The match finish happened when Rousey hit the Piper's Pit, then transitioned to an armbar for the win. Enough with this match. I am not going to spend any more time talking about Ronda Rousey. She needs to drop the, the SmackDown Women's title. When is Charlotte Flair going to come back? Because I know I don't like Charlotte Flair and her 10 million title reigns, but... It would be nice for her to come back and take the title off of Ronda Rousey. Seriously, make the women's in division interesting again on SmackDown. Because I really don't care about the women's division on SmackDown at all. Especially with Ronda Rousey as champion. You know, it's, you're going to get a boring match every time Ronda Rousey's in the ring. And that's not good for your champion. That your champion is disinterested. I don't get it. WWE, seriously. Look at the Raw Women's War Games match. Each of those women put their bodies on the line. Ronda Rousey in her match against Shotzi looked like she didn't care. As her style came off as basic. I'm moving on. Next up we have Bobby Lashley versus Austin Theory versus the champion Seth Rollins. For the United States Championship. It was nice to see the United States Championship be second billing here from the main event. As that should be that. Not like midway through the card. If that's going to be the only title on Roar, that should be the second spot on the card. When doing these premium live events. Now this match was very good. This was... Intense, fast pace. Each of the three participants in the match did a great job making sure that the action was there. Nice moves, including a sequence that included Lashley hitting the hurt lock on Theory, only for him to roll Lashley's elbows down to the mat, only for Rollins to hit a frog splash to break the pin. The finish happened when Bobby Lashley hit a spare on Rollins. 
when Rawlins was trying to execute a maneuver on Austin Theory, and Austin Theory lands on top of Seth Rollins for the three count and becoming the new United States champion. Very good match. Then we get a promo for the Royal Rumble. Coming up January 28th, 2023. That's right, we have no pay-per-view in December. That means you'll probably have no premium live event for at least six, seven weeks. It's like... That's a pretty long time between events. Seriously. I hope they rectify that next year with their premium live event schedule. Because that's pretty much a long time between events. Then we get to the main event. And yes, there were only five matches on this card for a three-hour show. Which is a gripe of mine I have with this show. Five matches on a pay-per-view. I know you have two War Games matches, but still, five matches. Come on. It was the SmackDown Men's War Games match between the Bloodline versus the Brawling Brutes, Drew McIntyre and Kevin Owens. Now, going into this match, this has been this whole story throughout this whole pay-per-view of Sami Zayn's allegiance. Is it with the Bloodline or with Kevin Owens? I like how they played it throughout this whole show. Now, I don't like promos during a pay-per-view. But here, this works out very well as it's playing towards the main event of the show. This is one of the rare times where I didn't mind having promos in the middle of a pay-per-view. Because it was building towards something. It wasn't just random promos. To build up the next Raw or anything. It was actually building up the main event of the show. And I think WWE did a great job with building up towards this men's Survivor Series War Games match. I have to say there was really good wrestling to start off the match with Butch and Jey Uso. The action throughout this match was very good. I like how the whole Bloodline storyline played during the whole match. As Jay and Sammy had to team up as Sami Zayn was the second entrant from the bloodline to enter the cage after Jay Uso. That was an interesting interval of the match. You had weapons, you had tables, you had chairs in this match. There were a lot of good spots. Solo, Sakota, and Kevin Owens fighting between the rings. As that was a very intense moment. You also had Sheamus hit the white noise from the second rope. That was a really good spot. Now the match ends when Owens hits a stunner to Reigns. As the referee was counting for the third time, Sami Zayn grabs the referee's hand to stop the count. Then Owens and Sami Zayn stood off. Jimmy Uso tried to hit a super kick but was blocked by Owens, which allowed Sami Zayn to low blow Kevin Owens. Then Zayn hit the Haluva kick, which allowed Jey Uso to hit the splash for the three count. And the Bloodline won the War Games match. That was a very good match to end the show. I like how Roman Reigns wasn't the factor in the match, instead it was this whole Sami Zayn, Jey Uso dynamic that was the factor in this match. As they were building this for like weeks, with them not trusting each other. So, I have to admit, that was a great way to end that match. Overall, with the exception of the Ronda Rousey vs. Shotzi match, this was a very good pay-per-view. As you had four out of the five matches were very good. And you had one really bad match. This is definitely a show worth checking out. As I really enjoyed it a lot. Only complaint I had with the show was that there was only five matches. And this was only a three hour pay-per-view or premium live event. I really think they needed to add another match. Would have been nice. I know it's a major pay-per-view. You could go a half hour longer at least at a sixth match. I know I complain about 
AEW shows going five hours long, but WWE shows go like three hours. In their pre-show, they didn't do nothing except talk for an hour. So they could have gone another half hour here with another match. Six matches is not much to ask, as five matches kind of felt very short, in my opinion, of a pay-per-view. Especially one of the big four. But overall, this was a very good show. Definitely worth checking out. That was WWE Survivor Series 2022. You'll find Anthony T's horror and wrestling show on these social media platforms. On Facebook, Instagram, and the Slasher app at Anthony T's Power and Wrestling. And on Twitter at Anthony T's Power. You'll find new episodes on DocDiscussions.com, major podcast providers, and YouTube. What's Anthony T watching this episode? Now, usually when I choose films to review here on this segment, it's something I choose. But I recently got a request for someone to have their film reviewed on the official Facebook page at Anthony T's Horror and Wrestling. As if you send me a film request, I will review it here on this segment, on this podcast. Case in point, the film I'm reviewing this episode is Like Father, Like Daughter. Now, this is a film from director Ken Ace Brewer, who runs B-Movie Television on Roku. He's the one who sent me the request to review his film, so I'm going to review his film. If you're a filmmaker and you want your film reviewed here on this segment, message me through Facebook at Anthony T's Horror in Wrestling or at Anthony T's Horror Show at gmail.com. With that, I will go into my thoughts on Like Father, Like Daughter. I will give you a quick synopsis of the film coming from Letterboxd. The synopsis reads, a psycho father and his homicidal daughter escape from a mental hospital, then go on a killing spree in a nature preserve. That is the plot for this film. My thoughts on this film. I thought this was very good, because this is the second film I've watched from Ken Ace Brewer, as I watched his previous film, Death Pock, The End, which I enjoyed. This film is much better than Death Pock, The End. First of all, the look of the film. The look of the film looks very more professional. It has more of that quality that you look for in a film. The look, the way the effects are handled. Overall, everything feels like a step up from his last film. Now, a the thing that I liked about Brewer's direction here is he does a very good job with the way he handles kill scenes in this film. As the kill scenes in this film are very good and some of them have an intense feel to them. I like how he sets them up. It's not like we're rushing through kill scenes. You'll get like a couple minutes breather and then I have a kill scene. And that's fine. Plus you have the intensity to ramped up with them, with the soundtrack blaring, which more often than not, sometimes you need a hot and heavy soundtrack for a horror film to work. And for a B-movie like this one, it works very well. As I was really engaged with the action in this film, I was engaged with the film's story, and so on. And I also like how... This film really does a good job keeping everything moving, as the pace for this film is good. Now, the film's running time is 68 minutes. And yes, it runs a little slow, but it's perfect and okay to run a little slow 
for a 68 minute film because well a it doesn't feel like two hours and b it feels like maybe your typical 80 minute film which is fine by me and i have no problems with films being a little slow if the running time's short because i'm not rushing to get to the next thing plus i want to see things developed and i think this film does a good job developing its story and it's a credit to the screenwriting as well as direction as the screenwriting here was good i thought brewer and mary get to it they if i pronounce it wrong i apologize do a very good job with the story i like how it does a really good job setting up its protagonists as I really liked how you get to know this guy and everything, which I liked. I like how they really come up with some of the death scenes in this film. How they come up with the way they balance the action, the dark humor, and the gore, which this film has. If there's one complaint I had, I wish there was more of a backstory with the killers. I know we get a brief backstory. But I wish there was maybe a little more than maybe like a couple minutes. But that's like a minor gripe with this film because I enjoyed this film. This film will be coming out on Blu-ray soon. I have no information when this is coming out on Blu-ray. But like Father, like Daughter will be hitting DVD and Blu-ray soon. Courtesy of Livid Media. For more information on the upcoming release... Of Like Father, Like Daughter on Blu-ray and DVD. You can go to LividMedia.org. Or go to Livid Media's official Facebook page. As Like Father, Like Daughter is a very action-packed and gory film. That will make you afraid of taking a walk in the park. I told you this is the last new show of the year, and it is. Next episode, episode 88, will be a best of episode. And there is one thing I have to do this best of. Talk about a film that literally was the most anticipated film and the most colossal failure of 2022. That's right. I have a bunch of Halloween Ends rants and my review of that film. Because that film was such a disaster. Last year at the Horror Whammies, I told you it was a bad idea to do a four-year time jump. And yes, it was a bad idea to do a four-year time jump. Now in this upcoming Best of episode, I will be going into the Best of Halloween Ends rants. Because there were a ton of them. As this film dominated the podcast over the last year. And it turned out to be the most colossal failure of 2022, everyone. I will go into the Great Cunningham trailer. Remember that bit I did? Right after my review of that film, I had to cut my own trailer of what I thought was Halloween Ends. I'll talk about that. I have an unaired Halloween Ends rant that I will be airing. And I have some more rants about Halloween Ends and the dumb ideas surrounding this film. That'll be the next best of. Plus, you'll get the review, which included an F-bomb. Because it was so aggravating to see how they set up the first two films... Only to do a third film to focus on Cunningham. I still can't get over the fact that they squandered a great opportunity after Kills. To just do something different. It made no sense with the first two films. Literally. I'll go into those best of rants in episode 88. Episode 89 will be the fourth annual horror show in horror whammies. That's right. I give awards for the best and the worst in horror in 2022. It's going to probably be a couple films for each segment. I can tell you that right now because the way my list right now looks like for that 
show, it looks like there's a couple films that are going to dominate both the horror show awards and the horror whammies. Then episode 90 will be the top 10 films of 2022. I will bring another podcaster onto the podcast and we'll talk about our top 10 films of 2022. Top 10 horror films to be exact. So episode 88 will be a best of episode entitled The Best of Halloween Ends Rants. Then episode 88. 89 will be the 4th Annual Horror Show and Horror Whammies Awards. Then episode 90 will be the top 10 films of 2022. So that's the next three episodes on Anthony T's Horror and Wrestling Show. With that, I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. Have a good day. Support indie wrestling and support indie horror. This has been a Film Arcade Media production.